With a new legal status, the California State Department of Finance expects $3.4 billion in recreational cannabis sales this year. Meanwhile, private prisons in the United States can also expect annual profits, around $3.3 billion. Starting a cannabis business typically costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, money that most Americans don't have, leaving opportunities to enter the industry accessible to a small number of wealthy and oftentimes white business owners capitalizing and profiting off an operation built largely on the backs of those serving time for pot. And when you start to examine who it really is in prison for cannabis, among other crimes, you'll see that the criminal justice system is not colorblind. Ingrid Archie was sentenced to prison on a marijuana charge. When Proposition 64 came into effect in California, she was one of the first people in the state to have her felony reduced to a misdemeanor. She is now a full-time employee at a New Way of Life reentry project, which helps the formerly incarcerated rehabilitate and rebuild their lives. Marijuana criminalization was a tool used in the war on drugs to incarcerate people, to fill up prisons, because I was a prophet when they couldn't enslave people. So prison became the new enslavement. Marijuana is a Schedule I drug. They wanted to classify it as a Schedule I so that they could use that as a way to target people in communities of color and charge them with it. Although blacks and whites use marijuana at the same rate, Blacks are nearly four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession. That is systematic. So we have to look deeper. We have to go back to the beginning of why those laws were created, why marijuana was even considered illegal. That was all on a racial tone. Our laws were created on a racial tone. The ratcheting of the drug war was intentionally planned. Uh, by folks like Richard Nixon to create an apparatus that allowed for the targeting and roundup of young people of color by criminalizing certain behavior associated with drugs and by investing tons of resources into the enforcement of drug policy. They gave conservative elements the tools to then target specific communities. As a kid, I was living in Linwood, California, which is next to Watson, Compton. Then I moved to a white neighborhood. Never had an encounter with police in the white neighborhood about anything. And I was shoplifting, graf doing graffiti, nothing. The police were just non-existent. They didn't harass kids. There's no metal detectors. And when I got back to LA, Thursdays was Crash, which was the Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums. It was a gang task force, basically a gang of the LAPD policing gangs. And what they would do was maintain the problems. The police would drive by and be like, hey, you know, such and such from whatever crib are, are out tonight, they're looking for y'all. Well, what go take them motherfuckers to jail then? There's nobody in Malibu that's trolling for Beverly Hills. Van Jones has a wonderful quote, and he said that he was surrounded by drugs. And then he goes on to say it was when he was in college and nobody was getting arrested. So that really bothers me. And that's one of the issues that I think needs to be addressed, that we go into poor communities and police them and pull everybody over, even when they don't have probable cause. And that to me is um, heinous. Where I was told to work kind of dictated the tactics that I would use in dealing with the public. You know, it's kind of uh, kind of interesting. I mean, if you pull over that Mercedes Benz in the city of Lakewood, you know, and you got a guy in a suit and tie in there, you're going to treat him a lot different than you would a beat up Mercedes Benz in Paramount that has three guys that kind of profile as gang members. You're going to, you know, instead of walking up with a with a you know your hand on your gun, you might have your gun in your hand. You know, that kind of thing. And it's based upon the training that law enforcement receives. Implicit bias is believed to be one of the reasons why we are witnessing such disparity in the criminal justice system. 
Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. For some judges, prosecutors, and police officers, discrimination is deep-rooted. Early practices following slavery, there were attempts to regulate Black freedom and to extract wealth from Black communities so that former slaves were then coerced into chain gangs by local sheriffs, held in local jails, Black codes, criminalized everyday behavior, and gave a racist criminal justice system and individuals with power and that the ability to then target Black communities. The racial segregation in the criminal justice system is like, it would make Jim Crow blush if Jim Crow was like a person. I mean, it's, it's horrendous. We could talk about the prejudice that's built into our culture, which is probably left over from the slavery and all the rest of the things, but it's also the news has touted pictures of people that have been in trouble and maybe make more of an issue out of people of color. So the people that have in their mind. Basically, drug dealers begin to take over our streets. In my opinion, 80% of crime revolves somewhere around, you know, drug deals and drug use. It's about time the streets get cleaned up. You know, it's really dangerous. The association with the drug problem in America became an image of poor black communities and justified the ratcheting of policing, arrests, and sentencing. Someone who comes from more affluent areas, you know, or communities, they're more susceptible to not have to go to jail for drug charges. They may get sentenced to treatment, but in poor communities, we're given a set bail amount that is astronomical to where we can't afford it, which means that if your caregivers are not able to take care of your kids, your kids are ended up placed in the system, and then that means that that whole family is broken apart. And block by block, that's basically what happens. In those courtrooms, if you don't have enough money to be able to post bail, then they feel like they can railroad you with charges because they know either you want to get out or you're going to plead out so that you can eventually get out. Beyond unfair policing, there is certain and systemic lack of opportunity in low-income and minority communities that leave people vulnerable to the pull of a life of crime. We see the disadvantage in our public schools, where communities lack proper funding, where Black and Hispanic youth make up 60% of arrested students. You're more likely to get pulled over. You're more likely to be seen as a threat. You're also, honestly, more likely to be a criminal. It's because you're disenfranchised, because you can't get jobs. Like, you're more likely to depend on weed to feed your family than a white man. Weed is just another thing on the list of things Black people, people of color, are more likely to be in violation of these laws that were set up to protect white people. A kid in Beverly Hills would join the Boy Scouts. You know, a kid in Paramount might join the local Crip gang. And, you know, for a whole bunch of complicated reasons, you know, uh, criminality kind of goes uh, hand in hand with that. I've never met a little kid that said, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a burglar or I want to be hooked on drugs because I live in an area where there's no access to health care and I've I've just been traumatized my whole life, and now I'm a drug addict, and I'm going to jump through windows and rob people's houses or steal people's cars and stuff like that. I've never heard a kid say that, right? I mean, there's reasons people end up in the criminal justice system, and it isn't always because they're some kind of deviant or a terrible person or who just wants to be a criminal. Most of the time, it's because of lack of opportunity and circumstances. The ways that they created this was by taking the resources from the communities. After school programs that were in place for kids to have somewhere to go when they got out of school, mentoring programs, jobs that are available, training programs, therapy services for people who face trauma. Those are things that would keep people from going back into a life cycle of going in and out of jail. While hope remains for marijuana lifers to one day be released from prison and re-enter society, nevertheless, the emotional stress of being incarcerated is a heavy burden to bear. Farrell Scott is currently serving life without parole in federal prison for cannabis. His petition for clemency was denied under the Obama administration. 
I am trying to remain positive and see the world through the view of the glass being half full so that I will eventually see my situation from the other side. But it is so very hard when you have a life sentence. Things are particularly difficult for me right now. I try to remind myself that I will recover from this instance. I just don't want to sit here for 15 or 20 years or more and give them the joy and satisfaction of keeping me down for that long. I try to think that this is just a moment in my life and that this moment will pass too. I just pray that it is sooner rather than later. You hold on to the hope of one day walking out of here alive and not in a box, but there's always that doubt that you may not. Other marijuana lifers like Corvain Cooper and Parker Coleman remain imprisoned for a plant and conviction supported by conspiracy law. Both of these men remain captives to the prison system. While an evolving marijuana industry feeds the pockets of green entrepreneurs and canisaurs. Entering the cannabis business legally today is an oftentimes expensive, arduous process. Many people of color have been turned off from an industry that has incarcerated so many of their own. And while these prisoners of prohibition have been criminalized, mainly wealthy white people are running the industry. They make it so hard for people of color to be in positions of power to operate medicinal marijuana businesses or recreational marijuana businesses. They box us out of that now. In 2017, Marijuana Business Daily released a study that showed 81% of cannabis business owners are white. Meanwhile, only 4.3% identified themselves as Black. 2004 is when I opened up my first collective. So there were 186 pre-ICOs, but there were only, out of that 186, about four or five of us that were African-American owned. And the reason that black people and people of color didn't really engage in the industry is the fear of what happened to me. I ended up doing six years in federal prison. And it's crazy because those same shops that the federal government raided are the same shops that I just got licensed by the state and under Proposition M in the city of Los Angeles. There's no explanation to that. I can't even explain to you why or give you any rhyme or reason to it. I can just tell you it happened. Uh, crazy as it sounds, unfortunate. Uh, but I'm here today uh, to finish what I started. Some states are implementing legislation that requires a certain number of cannabis licenses to include someone in their business who was formerly incarcerated for cannabis crimes. But is this enough? We're doing everything we can in California to give a leg up to people that have been most affected by the inequities of these drug laws, and particularly marijuana laws, by at least doing something about giving them an opportunity to be in the business of pot. California requires a part of taxes from cannabis businesses to be reinvested into communities disproportionately affected by past federal and state drug policies, reduces criminal penalties for marijuana-related offenses, establishes social equity programs to support victims of the war on drugs in obtaining marijuana business licenses. Massachusetts, the first state to include a section of the law which requires the participation of communities criminalized and economically crippled during the war on drugs. Oregon. Portland is the first city to direct a portion of its cannabis revenue taxes into the reinvestment of communities of color. We created CMA, California Minority Alliance, to talk about the social, economical, disadvantaged communities people who had uh, felonies, and we felt that it would, would not be fair or right if we moved forward in this industry, legalized it, and then those people who received felonies for what we were actually doing and gonna be allowed to do, and they weren't able to participate in the industry, we thought that would be a travesty. So CMA spoke out loud against that. And that was a fight we took on to create social equity, to say this industry cannot move forward. And you, you guys have a responsibility to dealing with what the failed war on drugs, the devastation that is left behind. We have to address that. That was the spirit of CMA being created and formed. 
and we are the largest minority organization that represents all of the minorities that want to come into the cannabis space, not just in California, but throughout the country. We have eight different chapters. We don't need data to prove that the odds are stacked against minorities. To call one Louisiana man a criminal deserving of a life sentence in prison for distributing cannabis, while a Colorado man counts his millions for doing the same, is the definition of injustice. Thus, it is crucial to ask our representatives for criminal justice reform now. Whether you medicate or indulge in cannabis or not, your perspective on prohibition has power. We need to immediately reconceptualize the cannabis industry as it continues to grow, to create a landscape as inclusive and diverse as its global community of users. Now we have an opportunity to pause for a minute and before we continue to move forward is address these issues so that we can now move forward in the future without bringing that ugly past with us. I'm not threatened by Jeff Sessions' rollback. It's all about money and they're always threatened by that so they're gonna figure out any type of way to counteract that threat. The feds are coming in and raiding all these dispensaries and shit and shock and all. Like, this is like, it's fear, it's a campaign of fear. While Philip Morris and all these motherfuckers that sell tobacco get ready and do the American thing of not letting people of color participate in the profitability of marijuana. But then, you know, they thank God for Snoop Dogg. You know, cause like they can't box us all out cause there's good white people and they're just like, we're over all their bullshit. So as much as they're gonna try to connive and no one's gonna buy Marlboro weed, bro. They're gonna buy Be Real strain, or they're gonna buy Snoop strain, or they're gonna buy Wizard strain, so go fuck yourself. As long as we have the power to vote, they're always gonna have to pull something out their tool bag to make us feel scared. But they've always been there, they always will be, and we're not going anywhere. A study at the University of California, Irvine, found that the children of incarcerated parents were three times more likely to suffer from depression and twice as likely to suffer from learning disabilities and anxiety than the average child. Those are memories you can't erase. We have to shut that down and let our kids know that there is a brighter future. Mass incarceration rips apart families. It hollows out neighborhoods. It perpetuates poverty. 